Thank you, Tiki, and good afternoon, everybody. It's so great to be live at the ABA conference. We're going to have some fun this afternoon because I'm going to be taking you into the future and trying to help you imagine what the world is going to look like, particularly from a technology perspective, with a lot of banking, investment, finance thrown into the mix. But I'd like to take you time traveling both forward and backwards in time. So let's go in a time tunnel. We're going back to December 2019. Picture 2019 and what you were doing back in December. Imagine that we're at this conference and I'm describing for you events that are going to happen over the coming 10 years, going near future, medium, and longer term future. And I say to you, in the next two years, our world is going to change in ways that you cannot even imagine. We're going to have an outbreak of a pandemic that is going to hit every single person on this planet, whether they're in a big city or in a jungle in Peru. It's going to hit supply chains. You're not going to be able to buy things like toilet paper. You're not going to be able to get the drugs that you need for your medications. Countries all around the world, along with pharmaceutical firms, are going to be rushing to invent vaccines to help inoculate us against this virus. And all around the world, countries are going to say to their citizens, you've got to inject yourself at least a couple of times with these brand new medications. And guess what? If you don't do it, you're not going to be allowed to go places. And that's still occurring today. I traveled up from the Gold Coast this morning. If I did not have my vaccine certificate and my mask, I would not have been able to get onto a Qantas flight to be here today. That's not going to go away in the near future. But it gets even crazier than that because the pandemic isn't over. We've hit a lull, and we hope that the lull continues to go down. But this virus has been so tricky that it continues to mutate. Let's hope that it doesn't. But it goes beyond the virus and beyond the supply chain because what we've also seen as an outgrowth of this is citizen protest. Who would have thought that truckers in Canada would be leading the flagship in saying, hey, we the citizens are not happy with de what democratic governments are doing. We want to take control over our own bodies and decide whether we want to do this. Well, so much can be said about the pandemic, but I'm not going to dwell on that. As if the pandemic wasn't enough in the last two years for us to contemplate, throw in all the climate change stuff, and now, on top of that, we've got a pending World War III at our doorsteps with Ukraine and Russia. Oh my gosh, if I had told you that back in December 2019, you would have said, Shara, Come on, that's a dystopian science fiction movie. That can't possibly be the two-year-out future. Well, guess what? It's the now. It's not the future. So what will the future hold? Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw in five months, five years of technology adoption, and I think it was Rebecca who said just a few minutes ago that we've seen about 10 years of technology adoption and acceleration in the last couple of years. Well, it's going to continue going really, really fast. Work from home and hybrid working is going to be here to stay even if the pandemic goes away. And it's not going to be just office workers. So it started with office workers because we can use computers and we can use technologies like video conferencing. And basically, we're knowledge workers. But if we add into the mix, technologies like augmented reality, virtual reality, robotics, haptics, which is the sense of touch, we can start to do things like control scientific instruments remotely from home by being immersed in a digital environment. And even before the pandemic, 
there were hooks in the software used to control science instruments, things called APIs, application programming interfaces, that allowed remote control of things like microscopes. There are robots today that you can control through virtual reality and literally mimic what you want to do by moving your body and the robot does exactly what the virtual reality controller does. So when I talk about working from home, it's not just sitting behind a computer keyboard. There's a whole lot more that will happen with working from home. And there are implications to this in terms of what happens to the socialization aspect of being with people. What does that mean for us as humans because we are social animals? But let's now go to looking at the technologies that are really going to impact the world of tomorrow. If I had to pick just one technology type that was going to have the biggest influence on every single industry bar none, it would be artificial intelligence. And when I use that term, I use it as a big umbrella term. It encompasses so many different technologies, but underneath it all, we're talking about techniques like machine learning and deep learning that utilize these massive data sets that help these artificial intelligence programs to learn on their own. So let me give you some examples of AI. And as I do, I'd like you to just stick your hand up and let me know if your company is using this. How about natural language processing? And here I'm talking about voice recognition and text recognition. It may be using your IVR for your phone system. How about chatbots? Anybody using chatbots? Is anybody using speech translation? That's just one example. Biometrics are another area of artificial intelligence. Facial recognition, voice recognition, gait recognition, you name it, even emotion detection. Being able to pick up someone's emotions from the expression on their face, the cadence of the words that they use or the specific words that they use. How about big data analysis and pattern recognition? I'd be surprised if any of you were not using that in your companies because frankly, that is where AI is super powerful, being able to take these terabytes and petabytes of data and crunch them into meaningful information that you can take action with in real time. And that's the key is real time insight and analysis. And there's a whole lot more. There's gesture recognition. There's controlling robots. There's driverless cars. You name it, it's happening with AI. But then it gets even crazier because AI is still just in its infancy, even though it started to be introduced in 1950. That's a long time ago. I reckon it's still just a two-year-old, but there's a new kid on the block called quantum computing that is starting to come into its own. I'm not gonna get into the physics of quantum computing because I don't wanna put everybody to sleep, but let's just say that it is computing on super steroids. So if you think about today's computers, it's either a zero or a one. With quantum computing, you're looking at states that allow you all kinds of fractional, if you like, qubit numbers in between the zero and ones. So the more qubits you have, the more processing power in simulations that you can do simultaneously and the faster you can solve problems. In July of last year, 
in the Harvard Research Labs, they invented a quantum computer, still experimental, that is capable of 256 qubits. That allows more simulations than there are atoms in this solar system. Picture that. Just picture how many atoms are in your body, and now try to picture how many atoms are in the whole solar system, and you get an idea of exactly how powerful that will be. If you can imagine matching that with artificial intelligence, big data that we're gathering from all kinds of devices, including the Internet of Things that has sensors all over the place, then you can start to imagine the power that we will have in terms of computing power with QC. And initially, QC will be expensive, just like the old mainframes were. But what I am predicting is that we'll have these big banks of quantum computers that companies and perhaps some very well-funded individuals will use on an as-a-service basis. So rather than everybody buying their own quantum computers, you'll be tapping into it as a service. Eventually, when the price point gets lower, just like it did with regular computing, you might have the equivalent of a smartphone in your pocket with quantum computing chips. This is not science fiction. This is science that's in the research labs all over the world and is starting to be rolled out now. So one of the other things that is going to fundamentally be shifting, a lot of it because of events of the last two years, is starting to move manufacturing back on shore. So over the last couple of decades, there's been this big move to take manufacturing and move it to where labor is cheaper. But when you start to throw in a technology like 3D printing, better known as additive manufacturing, as well as traditional manufacturing, then you can start to become self-reliant, which is what we need to do right now, because if you look at the shelves in supermarkets, there are still shortages, and it doesn't look like there's any end in sight in the near term. So with added manufacturing, what you're doing is putting down layers of things. And it's not just plasticky stuff anymore. Most of the 3D printers that are available commercially use multiple materials at the same time. It may be metals, it could be plastic, it could be almost any kind of material that you want. There are 3D printers that use construction refuse to build homes, for heaven's sake. There are 3D printers that use synthetic, um, or synthetic um, materials that are living organisms or even stem cells to do bioprinting of things like skin or cartilage. And it gets even better than that. In late last year, in November, there were scientists that invented a nanoscale 3D printer that used copper atoms to design structures that are 25 nanometers wide. That is so tiny, it's unbelievable. It's 195 copper atoms. To give you some scale, the smallest thing that you can print using today's metal printers is 100 micrometers. That is 4,000 times larger than these new 3D nanoscale. One single hair on your head is 3,000 times bigger than a nanoscale 3D printer. Climate change, sustainability, super important. There are so many technologies that are going to play into this. Solar power is really important. How many people, by the way, have solar on their home? Anybody? Oh, good. A few of us, yes. That's important. But of course, you need sunshine for solar to work. Wind power, well, that's not something you're likely to have on your house unless you have a farm. But that's another renewable energy. But there are a lot of other ones as well. 
What, one that's really interesting and where we're starting to see a lot of investment in Australia is with green hydrogen. And that's where we're using renewable energy like solar or wind to take H2O and split it into hydrogen and oxygen and then use it for fuel cells or batteries or to power hydroelectric plants. Another really cool energy type is something called a wave roller. So if you can imagine boat rudders turned upside down and put slightly offshore with a cable that goes to a hydroelectric plant, perhaps along the bottom of a sea, fled, sea um, floor or right underneath, and it's harvesting the kinetic energy from waves and using it to power an electric plant. Those experiments are happening. You might think, well, that could be really detrimental to marine life. But what's fascinating is that they're actually forming artificial um, barrier reefs. And the marine life actually likes the wave rollers. That's pretty cool, isn't it? One that I really like and that I think is definitely worth investing in is something called blue energy. How many of you have heard of that? Anybody? OK. Well, blue energy is basically harvesting the kinetic energy from salt when fresh water from like a big river or lake meets the saltwater ocean and you're using nanopore membranes to be able to capture this kinetic energy and use it directly to power plants or to store this energy in batteries or fuel cells. This is another technology that is really deserving of investment and something I think that the banking and investment industries should be looking at funding companies that want to do research in this area. So how about cryptocurrency? We heard a little bit about it, a little bit of history. But actually, going back to 208, a person or persons of unknown origin named Sato uh, Satoshi Nakamoto designed this because he or they wanted to have a currency that cut out the middleman, which is all of you, the banks, and basically designed both blockchain, which is the underlying algorithm that ended up being used for a lot of other things aside from cryptocurrency, as well as designing the first crypto, which was Bitcoin. So fast forward to where we're at in 2022, and what we've seen is that Bitcoin, as well as many other cryptocurrencies, have become very popular, and because of that, the ledgers that they use to be able to validate each transaction, especially Bitcoin, have become very large. And what that has meant is that it uses a lot of electricity and energy to be able to do any kind of transaction that uses Bitcoin. One report that I saw was that there was at least $178 worth of electricity into every Bitcoin transaction. And this is specific to Bitcoin, but it's not necessarily inherent to every single blockchain type of application. So as I go further into the future and I think about quantum computing, number one, with quantum computing, you know, computers that are super fast, you're going to be able to bust up almost any kind of encryption technology that you can think of. So what will happen, I think, with cryptocurrencies is that the ones that we see now, if you like, are the prototypes, but eventually we're going to see quantum-based cryptocurrencies that use a whole different kind of encryption, one that can't be broken by quantum computing because it will also use quantum computing. Having banks in the industry will also be, I think, very beneficial because right now, cryptocurrency has no inherent value other than the value that people put on it. And there's nothing backing it. There's no gold, there's no silver, and it's extremely volatile. There was one day in December where um, a lot of the cryptos fell by at least 30% in value, and it just keeps going up and down. So there's a new kid on the block, and that's the metaverse. 
and you've probably been hearing a little bit about it, but let me just try to give you very quickly a little bit of an overview of what the metaverse is. So if you like, it's building a digital world that in many ways mimics the real world, but it's using technologies like blockchain and cryptocurrency as the coin of the realm, but it's also using technology like augmented reality and virtual reality to immerse you into a digital world. Now, I don't know, how many of you have ever put on virtual reality face masks or headsets? How long do you like to keep them on? Not very. They're not comfortable. If you think it's bad enough to wear a mask, think about being inside, you know, wearing these clunky virtual reality headsets all day long and being tethered to a computer because they need the computing power to be able to power up these virtual worlds. Well, in these virtual worlds, what they are doing is, if you like, gamification, but in a way that also involves investment. So you can buy and sell property using cryptocurrency to buy it, or you can buy and sell almost any kind of good and service that you can think of in the real world, but it's digital. And the value that it has is really the only, only thing that holds it up is the value that other potential buyers and sellers put on it. It doesn't have anything tangible. So I think the evolution of the metaverse, which is a fascinating concept, is going to have to change to when VR gets a lot easier to use, but also if we can tie things in the digital world into the real world, into real tangible assets, then I think it can have some legs. Or if we're doing something like having a service in the metaverse where people can meet in a three-dimensional world and see each other and interact or we can prototype things, that has some real value. But if I had an extra million bucks to spend on property, I think I'd rather buy real land and a real house than spend a million dollars on a piece of property in in the middle of the metaverse. A whole lot more to say on that and not enough time to go into it. Now, there was talk about a chief payments officer as a new job of the future and a new C-level role. I think chief ethics officer is another one that's going to be absolutely fundamental. If you think just about artificial intelligence, think about how much can go wrong when you've got these machines that are sucking in big data sets and making decisions based on the information that they infer from data sets. First of all, all of our laws and regulations right now are built on the principle that it's actually humans that are making decisions. But this stuff happens so fast that humans are not in the loop, and you can get some really unexpected results. One example to make it concrete, there was um, an experiment done a few years ago in the US with looking at parolees and deciding whether or not they ought to be granted parole. And it turned out that the AI that was being used was le very lenient towards Caucasian men and much harsher to people of color. And there was nothing in the algorithms that were used that would have actually made it do this. And the researchers were actually quite perplexed. My hypothesis is that the AI looked at all these reports that were written by real people about the history of the prisoners and Underlying this were some social biases, and the machines picked it up and used that as part of the decision making. Ethics is going to play such an important role in so much that we do in the future. So what's going to happen in the future? Are we going to take tech into our bodies? Well, the first place that we're going to take it, I think, is with smart contacts. They're already on the very near-term horizon, and some of them are commercial or are almost commercial. 
So what I'm talking about here is taking everything that you have on your smartphone, adding in augmented reality and adding in biotech and putting it all into something that you can take in and out of your eyes. So right now, all three of those little silos are being separately worked on. We've got pharmaceutical companies that have um, smart contacts that are able to do drug delivery, measure intraocular pressure to look for glaucoma, have corneal bandages. We have companies that are designing smart contacts that give you an augmented reality view. So instead of wearing glasses, you're wearing a contact. And we have other companies that are looking at the ICT side. Imagine being able to blink and zoom in and be able to see things better, or blink and start taking videos. Once you start combining it, whoa, what if you then get into brain implants? Oh my gosh, that work has been going on in research labs for more than a decade now. It started with research for memory to help people who have diseases like dementia or Alzheimer's regain their memories. But it's now starting to expand beyond that to help people who've had really severe spinal cord injuries to be able to start to walk again simply by thinking about moving their limbs and having the wiring, if you like, in their nervous system rewired through these AI chips. Organizations like DARPA have also been doing experiments for quite a number of years now in looking at putting brain implants into soldiers to be able to control pain if they're injured and also to be able to control their emotions if they've suffered from something like post-traumatic stress. But think about it, if you've got a brain implant in you, who owns that implant and who gets to have access to it? And the idea from many of the researchers in this space is that they want to connect you directly to the World Wide Web. What if somebody hacked your brain? Now, the thought of being able to gain a new skill by connecting to the web and download it or have any question answered might be very appealing, but what's the downside of all this? Just because we can do something, that doesn't mean that we should. And what about the future of health? Is it going to go beyond that? And the answer is yes, it will go beyond that. And we're already starting to see the beginnings of genetic research where geneticists have already found that they can take a mouse with progeria, a rapid aging disease, and turn back the clock and make the mouse younger. What's going to happen when we can take this same genetic engineering technology, put it into a human, and make our bodies younger? There are scientists who believe that within the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to find the gene that controls aging. And when we do, we're going to be able to put a stop whenever we decide at whatever age we like, we're going to stop aging, and we'll be able to live for somewhere between 400 and 800 years old. Imagine what that will do to society. Oh my gosh, do you want to work for 800 years? How would you like to be married to the same person for 800 years? <laughs> What's that going to do to wealth transfer? What's that going to do to the social contracts that we have, like marriage? People will probably have multiple families if that takes place. You know, we're getting to this era of precision medicine, and part of it also goes with nanotechnology. Nanobots are these teeny, 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 tiny robots that are nanometer size. And believe it or not, it's not science fiction. This is stuff that's happening in research labs today. In 2018, a paper was published that showed it was a collaboration between Arizona State University and China Nanoscience Technology Technology Institute, where they had designed a DNA-coded nanobot that had particles that attracted to a particular type of blood tumor. And as soon as it found that tumor, it unfurled and injected it with a drug that made it starve off the blood supply and kill the tumor. We're talking targeted precision medicine. So 
initially, we're talking 10 years out now, right? But initially, we're going to see nanobots in our bodies that target specific diseases. But eventually, it's very likely in the 10 plus year horizon that we're gonna have nanobots swimming inside of our body as little guardians looking out for any side of disease in all of our different organs, and we might have different bots for different kinds of organs, and they're going to take proactive action inside of our bodies before anything goes wrong. That's getting into the world of science fiction. And speaking of science fiction, the very last thing that I'll talk about, which sounds like science fiction, but is science today, is space travel. And gosh, gotta love space travel. It really is the final frontier, and it may be the savior of humanity. And the reason that space travel is becoming real is because of investment, mainly by private industry, but also with the backing of a lot of venture capitalists of reusable rockets. That's key number one. Key number two, on both the moon and Mars, we have determined for sure that there are multiple areas where there are, is water. We've also determined irrefutably, just in our own galaxy, that there are thousands of planets that orbit suns, and a lot of them are in what is called the Goldilocks zone, which is human habitable, and already we've determined that some of them have water. So that's a key ingredient for space exploration. Add in robotics and 3D printing and being able to use whatever material happens to be on an asteroid, a moon, Mars, some other planet, it'll probably be the, be the robots that go out and prepare the habitats for us and then the humans can come and inhabit that place. What an exciting future that would be and talk about a huge area of investment. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time this afternoon. I hope you have enjoyed this little ride into the future, and I would be absolutely delighted if you would connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to stay around, but unfortunately, I'm based in the Gold Coast and have to fly back. But please feel free to contact me and ask me any questions that you have. Thank you again.